Welcome, Thomas. How are you, brother? I'm doing Good well. To Good to see you. How have you been? In New York? New York, New Jersey, uh, 2020. Days are not really a thing anymore. Location has also been sort of, you know, thrown by the wayside. It doesn't really matter where, where you are to a certain extent. You're just kind of inside and it's boring. Um, things look a little bit more vibrant in Miami. <laughs> Well, we do have the sun down here. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could tell us just a little bit about yourself and background and how you got to where you are and what brought you here today. Sure. So, um, in a previous life, before I got into into Bitcoin and uh, and crypto uh, more broadly, um, I was a swap and derivative lawyer. Uh, for a law firm in New York, and then in-house counsel for, for a large bank. Um, around 2012, 2013, uh, what was sort of just a passive hobby uh, in, in reading about Bitcoin and uh, the cast of characters associated with Bitcoin in the early days turned into more of an academic obsession. Um, so started the transition to uh, to see what I could do uh, or if I could make a, a full-time living out of um, transitioning to that space. Um, so I had bounced around the space for a little bit. Uh, I was with a firm called Digital Asset Holdings in 2015. Um, they were, uh, in ancient history, a, a, a Bitcoin company that, that was playing with sort of colored coin solutions uh, for tokenizing assets on the Bitcoin blockchain. But they became the first software development firm to really start um, the, the narrative around it's about blockchain technology and not Bitcoin itself. That there was a lot more to these concepts uh, um, that, that could be leveraged by existing financial institutions and um, sort of increase efficiencies and open up a whole new world of capabilities with, uh, with the technology, with the core technology. Um, that uh, that narrative has sort of played out over the last couple of years and has become something distinct and separate from from the Bitcoin space. So you know, some the vocabulary, as you know, as we've talked about many times before, is a little bit confusing for people. But the concept of a permissioned ledger uh, or a walled garden is is separate from uh, you know these permissionless decentralized networks today. And that's really where I wanted to focus, like getting more into the tech weeds. Uh, that's where I think the true innovation is, and specifically with Bitcoin. So around uh, late 2015, I got recruited by Fidelity Investments to move up to Boston and join their Bitcoin incubator uh, and help them build out um, their early products and uh, research and development um, uh, aspects of uh, exploring the new technology and figuring out what was possible. Fidelity was uh, tremendously supportive of um, of that learning process in the early days, and today they uh, they continue to develop uh, interesting new business units. They're by far the most forward thinking financial institution coming from that that legacy world uh, when it comes to Bitcoin. Um, today I run a Bitcoin investment company called Hollow Capital. Uh, it's a multi strategy approach to investing in uh, in Bitcoin and the broader uh, crypto asset class. Uh, the, the, the primary goal is to accumulate as much Bitcoin as possible, uh, but also invest in uh, other assets that have the potential to either supplement or supplant Bitcoin as that, um, as that uh, internet native uh, digital um, asset. And, and, we can which, get into and which assets are those, if you don't mind sharing? Uh... So ones that we like, I mean, if we look at, we look at Bitcoin as sort of the, um, uh, uh, the value. Bitcoin class, uh, you know, um, for uh, what would be a decentralized um, digital digital asset. Um, but if you look at Bitcoin, it does have some potential existential risks as the protocol continues to develop uh, down the line. So, if privacy is one of those things that could degrade the value of Bitcoin over time, um, we would look at coins that. Uh, have other solutions to uh, enhancing fungibility through increased privacy mechanisms. Um, the concern there would be if um, 
you know, you have a bifurcation of good Bitcoin that are accepted and in the system and bad Bitcoin that are sort of blacklisted and kept, you know, kept out of uh, normal course of business for, uh, for exchanges and for folks that have, um, I guess, reporting requirements, crypto hedge funds, for example. Um, you know, other, other types of assets that we would look at, I mean, in that privacy bucket would, would be like a Monero. I think Monero is probably the most used privacy coin out there, a Zcash and, and so on and so forth. Um, if you believe that governance is a problem with Bitcoin and, you know, there will be future forks, uh, we would also look at other, other projects that try and solve, um, I guess, the, uh, the, the software development um, decision making process in a, in a different way. Um, those are, I mean, we could spend hours on either one of those, <laughs> but at a high level, that's how we kind of like look at the space. Um, the other two prongs for the fund, we like to identify things that, um, uh, are broken. So things that have either technical or economic, uh, uh, vulnerabilities, um, more often than not, it's the result of fraud. Um, looking to take advantage of retail investors to not properly diligence um, these types of products. And we like to look for opportunities to, to take the other side of those trades. It's very difficult right now. You can't um, effectively, it, it's extremely expensive and, and difficult to short any one of these cryptocurrencies with any amount of confidence over a longer duration. Um, but as the asset class continues to mature and the infrastructure becomes more robust, and we expect um, normal market the dynamics to uh, develop and um, and, uh, and progress uh, alongside that. Um, we've also uh, been involved with the North American um, mining operation wave that has happened over the last, I would say, you know, four to six quarters. Um, as uh, as energy prices in North America become very cheap, and very competitive with other parts of the world. Um, we're seeing uh, large-scale Bitcoin mining operations come to the U.S. and Canada. So we have um, been uh, supporting sort of treasury management services for um, operations as they uh, as they contemplate spooling up um, here in the U.S. and Canada. Um, in addition to HODL, uh, my partner and I are spooling up a nonprofit to support Bitcoin core developers. Um, it's a uh, it's a volunteer project, as you know, so it's difficult for some of the uh, the, the developers to make a living working on Bitcoin full time. But it's it's quite important to continue to uh, make it more usable for folks, uh, more secure, debug, just you know continue developing some some great you know features and use cases as we uh, continue to uh, to expand the technology. So the hope there is to get more resources in there for the people who are doing some of that, that critical work. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a mouthful. I guess I'll pause there and we can decide wherever you want to take the conversation. Well, well I had a, a kind of a personal curveball question for you. Um, back in, I believe, March, where we had this big liquidity event, um, I always personally felt that Bitcoin was this great hedge against this economic uncertainty and uh, potential inflation and in, in, uh, weaker currencies, money printing, these things that um, are the concerns that get most people into Bitcoin and gold in the first place. Um, I felt personally pretty concerned and a little freaked out when Bitcoin sold off in March uh, and just basically tracked and it still to this day semi tracks the uh, the S&P or SPY. So um, that freaked me out and I even sold off some Bitcoin in the in the uh, dump that occurred in, in March because I felt a little bit disenchanted um, and I'm playing devil's advocate here because you know I'm a fan of, of cryptocurrencies in general. but. Yeah. Um, for me, that that shock and how um, correlated it became um, really freaked me out a bit. And I understand that everyone was searching for liquidity. Everybody was trying to grab cash and hold on tight. Um, but for those out there like me who 
um, felt like that is the perfect time period for Bitcoin to shine and to say, you know, th we are the safe haven. And and by the way, gold sold off as well. Um, what? How would you assuage the concerns of those who are thinking that the bottom of the S and P or the bottom of the tech sector has still is still not in? And um, if so, why is it that, or how is it that during that next sell off, Bitcoin won't just sell off like it did in March? Do you have any thoughts on that, given the macro environment we're in and where? where we're going and you know things of that nature yeah that's a great question and we we we've been writing and um sort of fielding that question uh probably ever since that that mid-march spiral uh, occurred so you know at a high level a risk-off event is going to cause people to sell pretty much everything we're, we're a long way away from bitcoin in its you know 11 12th year as a brand new asset class challenging the US dollar as the you know globally accepted store of value safe haven asset. So in something that is as uh, jolting for markets as March was, March March kind of hit it shouldn't have been such a surprise because you know there were indications of how severe the virus um, the impact of the virus was going to be but I think once that reality start to uh, it started to hit in, you know, Milan, New York, Seattle, I believe got hit, you know, just before New York, maybe a week before. But, you know, when the market really decided to um, to react, it was um, it was pretty scary how it decided to um, just seize up. And um, it was a it was a, a sell off across all asset classes. Bitcoin was almost most of it was more severe than other asset classes, primarily because of the uh, the exchange infrastructure. So there are certain um, you know options exchanges like Bitmex, Deribit, FTX that have um, uh, liquidation mechanisms built in. Um, Bitmex in particular got caught in a liquidation spiral and it made that sell off much more severe than it would have been without that that mechanism, so to speak. Um, they have um, safeguards built in for the exchange to operate and sort of deal with, you know, how it how it offers leverage to its clients, both retail and crypto funds, some institutions trade on it, market makers. So um, that really caused the Bitcoin sell off to be far more dramatic. Um, Bitcoin did bounce back a lot faster than some other asset classes, um, which, you know, to me is indicative of that, uh, that, um, that, that liquidation spiral um, being uh, part of the reason why it was more severe and sorting that out uh, in Bitcoin um, really had to sort of bounce back faster than a lot of other asset classes, if that makes sense. So without that event, it was two things. The risk off is going to happen to Bitcoin. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's too early to say that Bitcoin is going to truly challenge, you know, the U.S. dollar or physical gold. Um, the sell off hit paper gold because people needed to raise cash no matter what. Um, I don't know how many people were were running to you know sell their physical gold uh, in the same way that you know Bitcoin, like retail individual Bitcoin hodlers probably didn't offload. But, you know, the institutions and the folks that were, you know, trading with leverage on exchanges, they sold in droves and we saw how violent that was. Um, so I think that the story of it being, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the story that the, the, the narrative around it being a store of value is a little bit premature. We need to let it continue to sort of do its thing. And I think it's really interesting to see um, uh, Paul Tudor Jones start to identify Bitcoin alongside, you know, gold in that narrative. You have uh, micro strategy adding a tremendous amount of Bitcoin to uh, to their balance sheet as as a reserve asset. So the narrative has bounced back. I wouldn't be surprised if we get another risk off event. Things don't look particularly healthy. Uh, from a macro point of view, um, I think a lot of people are nervous that a second wave or or, or uh, uh, maybe it's something you know more germane to the the, um, 
uh, the financial system. Um, but I'm, I don't feel like we're out of the woods quite yet. And in another severe risk off event, Bitcoin's probably going to go down. The question is, is it hit as hard as anything else? And how does it perform against um, a range of other asset classes? And I think that that is really a matter of perspective. A, um, a retail, uh, a retail investor that looks at Bitcoin as sort of a savings account from uh, from a country that doesn't have access to the global financial system, the way a uh, American, a New York based hedge fund does, are going to treat Bitcoin in completely different ways. Um, and, you know, one other point, uh, just to, to, to expand upon that, a lot of people talk about Venezuela, Argentina, Zimbabwe, and, and countries that have um, have endured, you know, hyperinflation and sort of uh, just common failings of their, of their national currency. Um, there's been a narrative that Bitcoin is going to be, you know, the saving grace for, 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 for these type of users. It's hard to get core data on that. We have local Bitcoins, we have Paxful volumes. There's a fantastic website called usefultulips.org. It's either .org or .com um, that looks at these and breaks it down country by country. But in the US, the retail investor numbers for demand are really um, not super reliable. But we do have um, quarterly reports coming out of Square. And Square's Cash App does offer users to buy and sell Bitcoin. And we can see their, um, their growth quarter over quarter is just explosive. And that didn't stop uh, when the coronavirus hit, which tells me, again, that's another, uh, another point uh, uh, that, that supports you know, my thinking on this. I think that you know, there's a big difference between the crypto hedge funds and the investors who are trading this thing and the folks that are accumulating it and looking at it as sort of a, uh, a, a savings account of the future. That was a, a, a winding answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, continuing on that devil's advocate narrative, um, do you think it would ever be possible for a government, our government, or governments collectively to either a try to confiscate this bitcoin or b try to make it illegal to trade and or buy or sell bitcoin um so i mean it has happened in the past if you look at um you know uh fdr's approach to to hoarding gold um in the 30s I probably yeah. should be exact here that happened um so it's definitely possible. I think the nature of the internet and um, the way that this has become um, such a decentralized phenomenon makes it really difficult for countries to coordinate to stomp out Bitcoin usage and transfers. Um, if it was possible, you think that they would have done it a little bit more effectively in, in a pandemic uh, <laughs> to stop out the, the virus. Um, if they were to coordinate to do it with Bitcoin, treating Bitcoin as a virus and they were effective, there would probably be some questions about why that would be more important than like a public health concern. Um, so I'm skeptical. I think that a country that takes themselves out of the innovation risk race is going to um, uh, do so at their own detriment to a significant degree. Um, and it looks a lot like countries that took themselves out of the uh, innovation race uh, in the in the 90s around you know uh, internet infrastructure. There were countries, author authoritarian countries, or uh, or otherwise, that decided that the you know uh, freedom of communication and access to information that the internet provides common people was something that was an existential threat to the powers that be in particular countries. And, um, you know, a lot of them are still playing catch up uh, compared to countries like the US and Canada and, 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 and Europe and other, others who um, sort of fostered that early innovation. I think the stakes are much higher with something like Bitcoin because it drives at the core of um, value and uh, monetary assets. So um, 
despite the stories of, you know, X, Y, and Z country banning Bitcoin or cracking down on it, we haven't seen it in any great detail yet. And I think that that's indicative of a real, a real hesitation to take oneself out of um, an innovation race. And as we see countries around the world, uh, in particular, you have these weaker currencies, the examples you mentioned, uh, Venezuela, Argentina, or Hungary, that have gone through hyperinflation. Um, what do you see in the cards for the uh, short, medium, and long-term future in terms of currencies in general, whether they are stronger or weaker currencies, especially as we have uh, the printers printing uh, at max speed right now around the world? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I mean, we're all sort of watching the live feed. There's a lot of, you know, extremely uh, intelligent people that study this full time. Um, I think, um, you know, macro ec economists, um, Nick Carter's done a very good job. Uh, he's uh, he runs a, um, uh, a crypto VC out of Boston. He's done a very good job sort of uh, framing the debate about whether you know, um, Bitcoin provides a bridge to dollarization of other, um, for countries of that have currencies that are either failed or failing. I think we'll probably continue to see that, um, uh, the dollarization, dollarization trend will uh, uh, accelerate. Um, I don't expect to see anybody so people, what you're referring to is people in Venezuela exchanging their currency for Bitcoins and then from there getting dollars. Yeah, basically using it, using it as a mechanism to acquire dollars and use dollars rather than using Bitcoin itself because Bitcoin is still not quite a store of value yet. Um, another another crypto analyst, Murad uh, Mamoto, um, had a great chart that shows the progression of Bitcoin from a digital collectible and lots of things, you know, uh, that it can acquire lots of attributes before it becomes a store of value, medium of exchange, unit of account. These things are built over time. Um, so to expect folks in Venezuela or other countries to immediately skip forward, you know, decades and, and start using um, Bitcoin as full-fledged money is probably a bit misguided or too ambitious, um, uh, too optimistic if you're a Bitcoiner. But it is a, a useful tool to acquire dollars, and that's in a risk-off event. And a lot of these countries have been in, you know, risk-off situations for quite some time. They're going to uh, want to acquire dollars. That's the that's the real safe haven right now. Getting back to your question, the the the, the I think we can expect a lot more of these. Um, you know, smaller countries to, um, there's gonna be a fight with some of them to uh, protect their own currency. Um, but we're sort of in uncharted waters. We're watching the live stream here. And I think that, you know, some countries are definitely appreciating the value of, um, of gold uh, as, a, uh, as a scarce asset. And I think that some are starting to consider the value of Bitcoin as a, as a fixed supply asset um, um, and whether or not that fits into their, um, their reserve strategy. And so how are you, uh, given the uncertainties ahead, how are you positioning yourself uh, and your fund? Are you uh, still buying the dips or are you trading in this environment or are you holding long? Yeah, we're, I mean, yes, we are, we are long Bitcoin. That has been sort of the, uh, um, the, the overarching thesis um, for this until something changes with the technicals. Um, I'm sorry, with the, the, the actual technology, um, not like, you know, trend analysis or anything. Um, the, the technological fundamentals of Bitcoin, unless those change, um, we still believe that it'll continue this trajectory of becoming a store of value and um, um, chipping away at certain medium of exchange use cases. So very large, uh, very large cross-border transactions, Bitcoin starts to make a lot of sense for some folks and corporations. So yes, we're long Bitcoin. We are um, 
uh, actively seeking out these special situations. Uh, we see a lot of opportunities in the DeFi space. Um, we see a second wave of ICOs coming. Um, those were uh, tremendously problematic, the first wave in, in 2017. Um, and a lot of people ended up, I think, getting, getting, uh, getting hurt with that. So um, this has been keeping us very busy. And there's been, like I, I said before, there's been a really exciting um, wave of interest from energy companies and oil and gas producers looking at Bitcoin mining as uh, a badly needed revenue stream, um, but also as a waste management solution for some um, for some uh, uh, problems inherent in their in their business. So um, with that, we've gone deeper into um, to the uh, to uh, the hash rate markets, which is basically another another commodity associated with Bitcoin. Um, and I'm happy to get into that, but. Hash rate are basically the computational resources that can be, you know, loosely refined into Bitcoin. Um, and that is a developing market um, that, you know, mining operations want to see uh, continue to develop because they'll be able to hedge out hash rate volatility risk in the same way that they need to hedge out Bitcoin price volatility risk to run a normal, sustainable, projectable, you know, business plan. Um, so we've been hard at work with that, um, but for the next, you know, going into this cycle, I think that Bitcoin and gold are uh, essential, um, uh, essential counterbalances for the uncertainty we're seeing from um, uh, central bank monetary policies uh, as they evolve or, or shift um, to deal with uh, a, a number of um, complications this year. And and what do you see, and you, you, you've touched on a few of these, but what do you see as the uh, some of Bitcoin's biggest challenges in these these coming years ahead, especially as we're in a very uncertain time with, you know, pandemics and, and things of that nature. Uh, also, uh, uh, I feel that we're seeing a continued rise of populism and nationalism around the world. What are those challenges that are, you're seeing uh, the most right now? I think that there's a lot of Bitcoin's Bitcoin's path to becoming like an established asset class is not something that that can be like manufactured or engineered. It, it's just track record and time. Um, you know, gold has thousands of years of, of, of a track record and you know, the US dollar has has morphed over time. But you know, there's you know, uh, 100, 150 years of it being a, a stable um, uh, world power with the ability to repay its debts. So, I mean, as a monetary asset, Bitcoin is going to take time and people are going to have to, you know, become comfortable with it. Um, you know, there's an element of infrastructure and education um, that can accelerate that or can, can hold it back. But, um, you know, nothing beats um, time in this equation. Uh, JP Morgan put out a good report that said, you know, when you're looking at uh, investing or diversifying your assets in uh, uh, today, um, if you're under 40, you're probably looking at Bitcoin. If you're over 40, you're probably looking at gold. And I think that generation gap is something that um, isn't, isn't really, um, altered by uh, zealots or evangelists going out there explaining for the billionth time what Bitcoin is and why it's exciting. I think I think most people that would be interested get it by now. And, um, you know, uh, for those that don't necessarily understand it or, or, or want to understand it, it's just a matter of um, when the timing is right for that individual. Um, to me, the most important thing is that Bitcoin continues to do its thing. Process transactions roughly every 10 minutes or so. Uh, no catastrophic network disruptions uh, or, or um, base layer uh, bugs that get implemented or exploited that are already there that we don't know about. Those are the important things. Um, whether or not we get an ETF this year or whether or not, you know, China bans people from, you know, um, um, thinking about Bitcoin or, or, or teaching Bitcoin or, or, or starting Bitcoin businesses, that's less important. 
that evolves over time. Um, and, um, you know, it, my, my fund is Hoddle Capital because it's a, it's a long-term progression. I mean, this is not, there's, there's a tremendous amount of volatility and there are volatility traders that are tremendously success, successful in, in Bitcoin and, and crypto. Um, but I think if this, uh, if this asset class achieves just a fraction of its potential, you're going to want a, uh, a long, boring strategy to, to see um, uh, that, that, the benefit of that exposure. And speaking of uh, emerging markets or what is um, said to be uh, the largest economy in the world in the next you know, two years, uh, China, um, do you, in Hodel Capital, do you have, uh, do you look at your long-term strategy as uh, bringing in any of these projects from markets like China that may be uh, particularly in interesting or even Korea? I know that they have made some traction with uh, their Ethereum copycats and whatnot. Uh, are, are there any projects um, that you're seeing from these emerging or rapidly growing markets that, that you, you are taking interest in or you're watching or would that change your strategy if something came out that was faster, more efficient, et cetera, et cetera? But the Chinese market is fascinating. Um, they're, they're just so well positioned to adopt sort of digital currencies. Um, uh, their payments have been years ahead in terms of using QR codes or NFC uh, contactless payments. And they're just uh, very easy touch points that are already embedded in how uh, um, uh, money is, is dealt with there that, that you know, the U.S. markets and, other, and others are, are still playing a little bit of catch up on. Um, that has uh, kind of lended an advantage to China in other in other respects. So the vast majority of Bitcoin mining operations are based in China. Um, the majority of, um, of uh, you know critical infrastructure projects like mining pools, for example, are also based in China, which means a tremendous amount of the liquidity, the exchange uh, activity, uh, also originates out of China um, as well. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has a, a has a real counterbalance. There's obviously you know, Coinbase and Kraken and Gemini are, are robust uh, exchanges. Um, but going back to the uh, the mining side of the ecosystem, um, it has the potential to start to become a, a centralization concern. So when I look at Bitcoin and this this asset class more broadly, the the true differentiator for the asset class that drives value uh, independent of gold or equities or bonds or, 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 or whatever is the element of decentralization, um, which is really just the mitigation of counterparty risk in a number of different ways. So you can look at Bitcoin's decentralization through a lens of how it's technologically distributed, how many nodes, how easy is it to run your own node and interact directly with the protocol. Um, economic decentralization, how many trading venues do you have? How many stakeholders, how much do they have? Do they have, you know, the control to, you know, pump or dump uh, the asset into oblivion? Um, and then there's like a social political component of, you know, how easy is it to coordinate change? Updates to, you know, the, the code base or um, rally support around one idea as opposed to another. Um, Bitcoin is, is, you know, the best in class, really in all three of these, these, um, these buckets, the, the, the tech, the econ, and the social political. But decentralization is not a, um, an out-of-the-box like feature set. It's not something that you can just slap onto your product and say, we are decentralized. Not a, not a security offering because we're decentralized. Um, it's something where the goalposts are constantly moving and, you know, it evolves over time. Um, so circling back to my point, which was, you know, about mining operations, um, one thing that I think is really critical is to focus on ways to further decentralize aspects of the community. So if there is a concentration of mining farms in China, or if there is, you know, a concentration of mining pools or, or any other service, um, not to pick on China, this could be in any country. 
um, if, if it has a concentration, then you know finding ways to, um, to to foster development in other places to mitigate that counterparty risk, so to speak, um, is something that's good for the overall project. Um, so you know it's a uh, it's a, it's a real balance because again, not to I mean. China has done extremely well. This is where a lot of the, um, the, the, the mining rigs come from because they've used that tremendous um, um, expertise in um, electronics manufacturing and semiconductor designs um, to produce the best mining equipment. But you know that, that could evolve into an existential threat um, for, the, uh, for the broader Bitcoin community over time. So, um, given that existential threat and your thoughts on uh, the crypto market in general, uh, how well? First off, how long have you been in the market? Um, in the uh, just in, in general, crypto, for HODL, a HODL, a HODL has been around since twenty seventeen. Okay, and how long have you been playing? Right. And personally, how long have you been playing in the space? I the first time I read about it, and you know, if I could go back in time, I would tell myself to buy as much as possible. But there was a Wired magazine article in November of 2011 um, that was like an obituary, basically. Uh, it was a, it was a retrospective. That it, there was this really cool thing called Bitcoin with a really quirky community of you know, libertarians and techies and um, uh, the price recently crashed. I think it went from like $32 to $3 or something like that. And the Wired Magazine article was just like, let's take a look at this, at this like, you know, quirky tech story. Um, so that was the first time I had heard about Bitcoin. And I was still in law school at the time. And the, the, the article was fascinating. I ended up, you know, poking around and, uh, I think it was Bitstamp. I, I looked at Bitstamp, which was still in like Slovenia. I, I think it was Slovenia at the time, uh, and the price had recovered. And um, I just kept looking at um, at it since then. Um, but uh, I didn't I didn't buy Bitcoin until until much later, which is unfortunate. <laughs> it's easy to do it backwards. Well, well, on that backward-looking note, uh, what? Uh... What advice would you give to a fresh out of school or in school young self to for young entrepreneurs that are interested in this space? Because as you mentioned earlier, there are a lot of new um, cryptos being launched now, a lot of DeFi projects. Um, yeah. If, if, if you were starting over from scratch right now, um, what would your advice be for some young entrepreneurs? Um, I really think that people ought to start at the beginning because we're still we're still learning so much about Bitcoin, uh, and it's so early. Um, and that's not to say that you stop at Bitcoin. Like, you know, there's a lot of value in other projects and uh, and experimenting with this. Um, but um, you know, jumping in uh, at, at like you know season four or season five. Is, is missing a lot of context and a lot of like important learnings that, that we've had um, since the beginning. Um, so, you know, my advice for everybody is to, to the best of your ability, it doesn't, mean, it, it doesn't necessitate you to like become, you know, fluent in C++ and um, really dive into the technicals, but to the extent that people can have at least a, like a, a decent mastery of how Bitcoin works, it's gonna help with any other project. Um, you'll probably decide to stay with Bitcoin. If you decide to go with something else, that's fine too. Um, but starting, you know, starting at the cutting edge is um, a good way to just, uh, I don't know, um, not necessarily set yourself up for failure, but I think you, you, you gain a tremendous amount from, of context and color from starting at the beginning. So dive into Bitcoin. Um, um, and then it really kind of uh, depends on who you are. If you're a designer, there's you know a tremendous you know cottage industry that's growing, uh, focusing 
on figuring out how to make Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies more usable um, because it's still a brand new technology. Um, it's not all hardcore, you know, tech and finance at this point. Lots of artists are also looking at this and doing great work, which helps with education and adoption. Um, that sort of thing, as you know. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And we're, I feel like we're still waiting on that killer app, right? That makes using crypto uh, almost blend into the background. Uh, just like the early coders in, in, in the 90s, uh, bringing um, shopping online to everyone's fingertips, right? It was making it Easy, easy and usable for anyone. Um, do you see anything like that in the pipeline or, or what are your thoughts on, on uh, the killer app? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting work being done um, um, to drive mass adoption for that. Like if, if the killer app is really what, what, what gets it adopted, I think about it in two ways. So, there's an example, Lolly, L-O-L-L-I, which is a, uh, a discount um, like retail shopping service. I'm probably butchering the description, but you get discounts, but uh, uh, paid back in Bitcoin um, as you route to, you know, wherever you want to shop. Um, that's obviously a huge use case for a lot of uh, people who are new to Bitcoin. Um, Lolly and Fold, but, you know, shout out to Fold as well. FOLD card um, offer Bitcoin cashback, you know, rewards for you know stuff you're going to buy online, anyways. Um, is is one I, I guess like consumer retail facing um, uh, killer app. Was that a credit card that uh, I guess in, invests the difference back or what into Bitcoin and then puts it into your wallet? Fold. Yeah, I think that there is a like a debit card type um, type uh, product. I have I don't know if that's been released yet, but I think that they use mostly um, like gift card discounts. Okay. Um, um, and then there's a mechanism to I guess pass on uh, the value of the gift card bought at a discount, and you, you get a, a Bitcoin a Bitcoin bonus. Again, probably butchering these business models, but I do think that those are both really interesting. You know. Thinking about like what what it means to be like a killer app, uh, it, it, the the utility value of it driving mass adoption, I think it's just like uh, excruciating boredom. Like that that's kind of Bitcoin's killer app. Um, the fact that it is uh, doing what it what it's supposed to do, and it doesn't deviate from that in any you know uh, jarring way really provides that um that safety and stability that that you know i think we're going to crave in this decade <laughs> so so you're thinking that hypothetically it goes up to a million dollars of bitcoin or 100 or whatever it is and it stays within a, a a range from that point before rising up giving stability liquidity and uh confidence to people coming into the market or what you know, that's one question I want to get in is, and it may be a little clickbaity or whatnot, but what is, you, you know, HODL capital? You, you HODL, but how long are you HODLing for? What is the target uh, value that you see in the future for Bitcoin's potential? Uh, I, I don't know, there's flipping answers like infinite. Um, but you know, volatility is relative, right? It depends on, there's a, uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of moving pieces to this. So, you know, if, if we're going to, uh, print, uh, an unlimited amount of dollars, um, something that has a fixed supply and growing demand, um, is, uh, difficult to price relative to, you know, unlimited supply of dollars. So to one extent, it could be theoretically unlimited. Um, assuming that things hold their purchasing power, I mean, there's just a tremendous amount of activity. And I've done uh, you know, a fair amount of work on describing the supply side mechan at, at mechanics of Bitcoin. 
um, and the fixed nature of that um, uh, to, to newcomers. And, and once you understand that side of it, the only thing that moves Bitcoin's price is the demand. Uh, more people are flocking to the stability and uh, boring nature of that, that fixed supply. So um, relative to the Zimbabwean dollars, I mean, Bitcoin is extremely valuable um, and um, could be worth an infinite amount of, of those. Um, it, it, it's hard to say, um, but I think that we're going to see it start to chip away at that, um, the, the total amount of value uh, that's attributed to gold as a store of value um, over the next, you know, five years or so. So I, I tend to shy away from from price targets if that's what you're looking for, but I wouldn't, I, I, I don't expect us to stay in this range for very long. There's a chance that Bitcoin becomes a failed project. Um, you know, I don't think that we were necessarily meant to just hold Bitcoin at a centralized custodian like a Coinbase or a, a Gemini or a Fidelity or something like that. Um, it has to evolve. Um, otherwise it becomes, you know, sort of um, just stuck. So it's going to be interesting to see how this, how this story unfolds. Um, but very bullish on Bitcoin. I think it's going to do extremely well in these volatile markets. Um, we are long-term term holders of this. And um, I don't anticipate, you know, selling a meaningful amount of our core portfolio anytime soon. Or trading a meaningful amount for that matter? No, no. Um, With leverage? <laughs> With leverage. You know, you have, the, you have the most exciting financial asset in the world and, and people still feel the need to put 100x leverage on top of it. It's, it's, it's <laughs> If Bitcoin will just do its thing, people will be happy. You don't got to get crazy and strap like rocket boosters. Like, like, like it's not volatile enough. You know, I, I've never understood that. Why people need to put on these 10, 20, 100 X leverage onto these assets. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, like unless you want to wreck your portfolio like completely. It's um, it, there's an element of a adrenaline junkie behavior to it. Um, and some people can do it. Look, there, there are, there are people who are very skilled at that. And as long as the, you know, nascent, uh, realities of exchange infrastructure doesn't, doesn't kill you, like, you know, it could be a good strategy, but that's, that's not ours. We like to take, um, a, uh, an insane bleeding edge asset class and try and wrangle a somewhat conservative approach. Um, this is a, this is a long-term you know, development. Uh, and by long term, you mean uh, five, 10, 20, 30 years? What, what are you uh, looking at? I mean, we're what, 12 years old? Uh, less, uh, 11 years old. Um, and out of that, out of the total uh, uh, lifetime of Bitcoin, how much of it has been actually tradable by anyone other than just a retail investor? Um, most hedge funds uh, still can't get um, you know meaningful exposure. They have to go through other products like the Bitcoin Investment Trust, or they're trading CME paper options. Um, but there are very few you know financial institutions like traditional financial institutions that are getting direct exposure to Bitcoin still. So you know the next five years, uh, if we see a meaningful push uh, into that segment. It's going to be the first meaningful push into that sector, um, except for around the edges. You have Andreessen Horowitz and other folks uh, uh, making um, uh, like crypto venture accessible, but direct ownership of Bitcoin, of the underlying asset itself, is still um, still not quite there yet. Um, so, a three to five year horizon is, you know. 30, 50% of, of Bitcoin's life to date. So it's going to be, it's going to be insane to see the, the, the pace of, um, of, uh, adoption and development, uh, increase over that time period. Um, products out of Fidelity with Fidelity digital asset service and, uh, Square's cash app have been live for a year, maybe a little bit more. Um, 
so that critical infrastructure component is still, you know, just unfolding. Um, as that becomes more ubiquitous and robust, um, you get the on and off ramps uh, uh, at like a much more uh, sophisticated level. That makes the demand side a lot easier. And as I mentioned before, the supply side is fixed um, and that needs to remain constant and super boring. And when you continue to develop out the, 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 um, the infrastructure for uh, folks to buy it, uh, who, 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 who want access to Bitcoin, that's where things start to get really exciting. Well, awesome, Thomas. Thank you. It's gonna go up, John. What, what's that? I believe it's gonna go up. This is not investment advice, of course, all the usual disclaimers, but I love the stuff. <laughs> Well, and there's awesome. a fascinating world beyond it too. And where where can people find you? Uh, website URL or on Twitter? Uh, what what's the best way to be in touch? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. First initial, last name. Uh, T Pacchia. T P A C C H I A. Um, DMs are open. Um, and and Huddle Capital's website? It's Huddle Capital. H O D L dot Capital. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you so much and uh, we'll speak soon. All right.